Welcome to Documentary First. I am your host. No, I'm not. I am not your host. I'm actually the documentary filmmaker. So welcome to Documentary First. I am not your host, Josh Lindsay. I'm the documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. And I am joined with some very special guests, uh, Jason Hoban. How you doing, Jason? Welcome. Thanks for being here. Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we also got Mr. Jeff Kurtenacker in the house. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks, you guys, for coming on. I needed to do an extra podcast this week to kind of get caught up, and I wanted to give Josh and Jason a break. So uh, anyway, thank you so much for making time for me today. I've missed both of you, particularly because I was hoping both of you would be with me in Normandy for this second go around, and that didn't quite happen. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with you guys, why you couldn't come, and uh, and then we'll dive into today, to today's topic, which has to do with sort of some sound things. And uh, Jason has been producing the podcast, so he's been listening to all of the things and I think has a bunch of questions, and Jeff maybe as well. So we'll start with there. So what's been going on with you, Jason Hoban? Yeah. Uh, well, hold on. I want to say this first. Christian, uh, I feel like you always are surprising me with somebody because be- I didn't know Jeff was going to be here today. So he hops on. I'm still cheesing from seeing him. So I'm super excited that yeah. I get to see Christian and Jeff. But when, I, okay, so I didn't make it out to Normandy this time and it broke my heart. I really wanted to go. But before you left, you said, hey, I'm going to, Danny and Flo are going to be in town please come over, have dinner with us. And I was like, absolutely. So I wrote down in my calendar, Danny and Flo are going to be there. Time passes. I kind of forget that the fine details, like putting Danny's going to be there. Uh, (laughs) So I go over to Christian's house. Well, just before I go over to Christian's house, she's like, hey, Flo Plana is working on a few things. And can you help us with some voiceover? And I said, absolutely. I love Flo. I love everything he does. So of course, so we're working on that. We're talking about maybe recording at your house. So then in my head, I'm thinking I'm coming over to your house to see you and Flo Plana. Like, I think we're going to, you know, so my wife and I, we drive out to Christian's house. She opens the door and there's Danny, there's Flo, Flo Boucherie. And I, I, I'm so shocked and stunned that I just was like, you you're here and i was at a loss of words and so i kind of feel like i got to relive the that feeling again having jeff hop on here and (laughs) being like oh what (laughs) yeah you thought it was just gonna be you and me but hey i brought the big guns everybody had that reaction when i walked in the room that would be amazing (laughs) (laughs) yes but other than that everything's great just working enjoying the beautiful weather getting outside loving summer so and you had started a new job which is why you it didn't end up getting to go with us. You want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, I took on a position with Animated Storyboards. They're um, they they're a company that does animatics. They have engineers in London and New York, and so I'm their Chicago guy, which is pretty awesome. I love doing animations. It's it's so much fun. Getting to like work in a hyper realistic world all day is just. It's so much fun, and so I, I've been having a blast. And I'm running Bounce Studios um, as well, so between the two it's just keeping busy and then getting out in the sun every chance i get so it's kind of feeling like time's flying by but yeah everything's fun and great good good i'm happy for you that's great fighting i didn't know about the uh, animatic job so congratulations yeah thanks and how are things for you jeff this is a good segue right (laughs) yeah absolutely uh well you can probably hear my voice i'm getting over being sick i had covid Uh, my kids got covid and then they were nice enough to share it with me. Fortunately, my wife, uh, she had it last year, but she um, so, so far has um, stayed healthy, which is good. So uh, I'm on the tail end of that, which just feels like there's a bunch of junk happening in, in my head. Um, but things are good. So, you know, I also wanted to go to Normandy this time around, but we had just moved um, out of California into Arizona. And that was just a it was a big undertaking and obviously expensive, uh, all those things to put a down payment on a home. And um, so we bought a new, a new home out here. And so it was just a lot of transition uh, in our life and a lot of money that flew out the window, um, you know, all for good things, but uh, it just was hard to make the trip 
a reality at that right at that time. So um, it was just sort of circumstances that kind of kept me from getting out there. Yeah. Well, we missed you, but we understand for sure. Uh, and there will be more tri- trips, the Lord willing, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you guys with us next time. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Of course. So uh, have you been able to listen to any of the podcasts, Jeff? I know Jason is forced to every week. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, My wife keeps up way more than I do. Uh, My free time is pretty limited these days, but um, she will tell me things, um, but I have been able to listen to the past few. Um, So I've kind of been caught up. I know on at least the last two um, and then sporadically kind of off and on before then. Well, good. So uh, just why don't you guys think about any questions that you have or thoughts that you have as you've been listening through. Um, Jason is our weekly editor. He listens through each one. He mixes the sound to make sure that it's okay for everybody's ears uh, and helps us, uh, you know, put it back together with the video. And so, Jason, we're so thankful that you continue to do that in a volunteer capacity for us every week. It really means a lot. Hey, I'm happy to do it. And you get to keep up with what's going on. So tell me what your thoughts are as you've been listening along on this new journey. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's it's fun because I do. I always tell Christian, like, whenever I see her, she's always got a million questions for me. And I'm like, I listen to you every week. So I'm pretty <laughs> up to speed with what's going on. Um, but it's great to be in the loop because from the get-go, I've loved this project. Uh, and so it's great to just always be a part of it and know where what how things are going and where it's going so i love doing it happy to do it um yeah not being there i was so bummed and i thought about so much because there's quite a bit that goes into location audio as far as just the logistics of maintaining the equipment getting it to each place getting things set up and you know being ready for what environmental conditions that are going to be thrown at you so um, I was really curious and I wanted to ask you about how did you handle the translation system this time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the whole sound situation was interesting and challenging because you didn't go. And so we had to think outside the box. It was the most difficult piece that we had to solve. Uh, and it was really up to the last minute trying to find out who was going to take your place and try to fill your shoes. Um, Taylor Banowski, who is now Taylor Gilchrist, she and Chad were married on June 25th. Congratulations to them. Uh, She's just incredibly resourceful and she's just like a hound dog. She will track people down and she and Chad had some contacts in France and they would go from one contact to another contact trying to find someone that could help us with sound. And we were introduced to a man by the name of Francois DeMarc and he is a complete and total Jim. He is an unbelievable person. Uh, He speaks fluent French and English. When Taylor first discovered him, they connected instantly, you know, just by FaceTime, I guess, or on Zoom. And I think they had a three hour conversation the very first time that they met. It was like a three hour long job interview. And before he would accept the job, he wanted to have a meeting with me. (laughs) (laughs) I think was over three hours. Um, And he's so funny. Two of the things that he asked me is he asked me to give him, well, yeah, my favorite French song and my favorite French movie and my favorite English song and my favorite English movie. And I'm like, are you kidding me? (laughs) Um, And so the first, I think it was like, how did you get started in this business? What inspired you? And for me, it was West Side Story when I was 10. And when I said that to him, he started singing, you know, the whole <laughs> musical basically. And we were instantly bonded. So uh, he was a, a very unique man. When I shared with him that I was a Christian, he said, oh, me too. I really want uh, my film experience to be different. I worked with the devil last time. I mean, <laughs> oh, no. This will be a better experience. Um, And so he came to the table completely prepared. I mean, this guy works on enormous projects and has an unbelievable resume. And why in the world he would basically volunteer to come on this project for very little money is beyond me, except he was so grateful to have a positive script with everybody getting along. Um, And so not only did he come, 
but he brought a brand new assistant that he's training up and another uh, camera assistant that he made friends with. And all of them are young in the business, but he really um, cares about mentorship. And so he had found these two little diamonds in the rough and has sort of been training them to be part of his team. And they both said that they would come along for nothing just for the experience and the resume building. Um, They were phenomenal. I mean, lights out phenomenal. And I don't know what we would have done without them. Um, And what Francois did for, um, you know, this shoot, which I didn't really even know was possible. It shows you my limited knowledge of filmmaking, but he decided that he would record everything on, you know, their own individual channels so that we would have the interviewer, the interviewee and the translator so that when we watch the video back, we'll be able to hear all of those. Um, And that was great in theory. Um, You know, he provided, um, you know, we each had uh, like, you know, an an earpiece and we stuck the translator in a car outside. (laughs) And so that was their little studio. Um, But the difference this time it honestly was not as sophisticated a system as we had set up. What we had done before um, was that I would translate something. And while I was speaking, the translator was live translating and vice versa. And the French person would only be able to hear French. You know, he wouldn't be able to hear himself. In this instance, what we had to do is we had that lag time of I would say something the translator would translate, and then the French person would answer. The translator would translate. And um, while it was recorded and we're going to be able to hear it on the video, the experience of how it was supposed to work was not was not as great, I have to tell you. Sure. It's a very it's very challenging technically to accomplish anything to that capacity. And I still am I'm blown away that we pulled it off how we did it. it several years ago. So it's a very, yeah, a very difficult and complicated thing because yeah, you're going to have this overlap of translation uh, and somebody listening and then translating that back to the interviewee. And that was kind of one of the hurdles we were able to clear, but it was still really challenging for us because we had to keep our translator very close. We were using things like Bluetooth signals, so we we couldn't be too far out of reach. We were always just around the corner or something like that. So even then, it was kind of difficult because we were worried that we would pick her up on the microphone just simply from being around the corner. So it, it's a very... How did we make ours work? I know that we had each had these little in earbuds. Yeah. And that Michelle had a microphone with a button that she had to push. Yep. How did the whole system work? Yeah. So I believe we were using two microphones and two earpieces and she was going between the two and speaking French into one, English into the other. So that's how we kept our channels independent. So it, it was very like a very coordinated dance and even like now i would have to bring out all the equipment we had to make sense of it and we didn't even really test drive the system until we got into normandy and even at that we were getting things going just before our first interview and i i remember feeling so much pressure in that moment that i was like if this doesn't work and are we going to do this interview and somehow we made it work and now for that that interview michelle phoenix was behind my head yeah, she basically we were, was behind my head and she was whispering into my ear and it didn't work that first time. We did test drive it, um, you know, back in Skokie. But yeah, we were really weren't 100 percent up to speed on how to quickly set that thing up. And I think I would like to do a postmortem on that sound system. And maybe <laughs> we ought to patent it because once yeah. we did get it up and rolling, it really was great. And quite frankly, it was experientially better so as an interviewee experiential experientially it was much better than what i had this last time um so i think though however in the edit i will appreciate um what francois 
you know, how he set things up, I will appreciate that much more. So we'll just have to see. Yeah, absolutely. So Jeff, what have you been thinking as you were listening through and. Well, this is not audio related and maybe you've talked about this before, um, but I never really knew how you chose what to reenact and what to tell with either still images or story, like uh, in an interview, just having someone speak. Um, so how did you, how do you choose whether it was this last visit or on the girl who wore freedom, how do you choose what to put the time and energy and resources into making uh, a reenactment and versus not? That is actually such a great question uh, because I hadn't thought much about that from this point of view, but um, it's a complicated cocktail, quite frankly. Um, in the very first, you know, in the Girl Who Wore Freedom, we chose to only reenact survivor memories and, you know, because we couldn't find any archival memory for that. So, you know, there's nobody has archival footage of Danny standing at her door while soldiers are walking by giving her gum and candy and chocolate. Sadly, um, there is nobody, um, you know, who has video footage of her father moving the German, a dead German out from under the tank of an American and being saluted, you know, there's no footage of that. So in that instance, we knew we needed to recreate Danny's memories and Jean-Marie's memories. So that drove that. This story is very different. Um, and it is focusing on the Battle of Carentan. And so we did um, know, you know, there's some specific battle things that take place. So we were focusing on those and we selected different parts of the battle that we knew we could film, you know, where the locations were, but then you have to look at who are the reenacting groups that you have available and what uniforms do they have and do they have the right vehicles and is everything marked correctly and is everybody's schedule available? Um, and, and can we have someone testify to to a thing that we're going to show on camera. Um, and that became very complicated this time because we thought we were going to have 60 reenactors that were in various different groups that could represent various different units and actions that happen. And because it had rained um, and all of the reenactors who were there for the D-Day ceremonies were wet, they all wanted to go home. And so even though they promised to stay, they didn't, they left. And so we ended up having eight reenactors. Wow. And we, own, we had a Jeep and we were doing a reenactment scene with Major General Taylor, who's very noticeable or like known. And so his Jeep is known, his, the way he looks is known, all of his uniform is known, and it's well known. And so in order to reenact something with General Taylor, you have to be actually spot on or you have to repaint a Jeep, which of course we didn't want to do. And mm -hmm. so we were supposed to have that Jeep on June 8th, but because the reenactor wanted to go home, he's like, I only can do it on the seventh. And so that meant we had to rearrange our schedule at the last minute if we were going to have the scene. Um, and so we ended up rearranging our schedule and doing the scene on the seventh with the Jeep to make sure that we had major general Taylor Jeep. Um, so on the, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's this combination of, you know, what we have, what's available um, and what time we have, et cetera, et cetera. But with, it seems with battle uh, reenactment, you know, I have not been behind the camera in your position looking at, you know, what you're seeing. But it seems like fake war is hard to make look like real war. So you have to I'm assuming you have to choose your angles, kind of when to cut, right, not showing actual combat but just sort of getting the viewer up into a point to sell the fantasy and then moving away to something else when it becomes unrealistic because they're not really going to fight each other so um how do you plan that out to choreo it's a choreography i would imagine yeah well we chose not to do battle scenes um that was that okay. was one of them i mean actually there was um there was one instance that i'm super proud of and i'm incredibly thankful to uh zach callahan and uh, Chad Gilchrist. Uh, and this really was Chad's idea and he brought everything he needed for it, but he really wanted to do some sort of battle scene, even though we weren't, you know, scripting that out. And so he 
brought these slingshots with little powder ball pellets, uh, fake blood. And so um, we he would have like a couple of guys on the sets pinging the guys in their helmets with these little powder balls and doing, oh, wow. you know, watching them getting shot in the head or whatever. Um, and he actually kind of showed, cut something together really quick for me to show it. And I couldn't believe how great it looked, but that was really an exception. And I have to give Chad credit for that. Uh, the other ones, you know, the first scene that we reenacted in this one was major general Taylor getting the orders to take Carenton and passing them on. Uh, the next scene that we did, we did hell's corner. There's a big battle at hell's corner, but at that battle you have, um, you know, you have lots going on and it, but at one point the Germans surrender to the Americans. And so we filmed that kind of surrender scene. Um, and then we filmed um, a scene where all of the different American 101st units come and meet together at the town hall and they share a drink of Calvados. We did that one as well. So we tried to strategically pick the things that we could reenact that looked yeah. legitimate um, and that fit our story. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. Next question. Well, I'm now I'm thinking about reenactments. I was like, I, I'll reenact Kavados anytime. <laughs> I bet that wasn't hard to get a bunch of people to jump in on. Yeah. For those of you who don't know what Calvados is, it is the um, Normandy version of whiskey. So Calvados is, um, you know, made from apples. Normandy is a huge apple region. And so Calvados is what everybody got drunk on back in the back in the day in the 40s because the French people were passing it out like water. Uh, yeah. So the GIs love that. <laughs> you know, I've been listening to and we've talked offline as well over the years of just the struggles of. Of fundraising and things like that. Right. And you've been very transparent with. Uh, the ups and downs of of all of that um has has there been a thought i don't know that the struggle of fundraising is unique to documentary film but have you thought about doing some like other films that are not documentary do, doing a more narrative driven film you know it's or? interesting that you should ask that today i got an email from uh, joe amaday of virgil films and he's been the one um, trying to find funding for us to do the Brave Dutch. But today I got the final nail in the coffin. Uh, it was like, you know, we, nobody has been willing to give us upfront money to make this. And so we're taking it out of our pitch documents, mm. um, you know, to networks, which was super sad, um, you know, and one of the suggestions is to do it as a narrative film. Um, he basically said that no one really was interested in you know what we had to offer as far as that documentary series goes um and i want to tell the story i want to make this this brave dutch story more than anything um so the question is how because if i raise the money let's say i do somehow out of some miracle um we still have to find a buyer for it it would be silly to make it at all if no one's going to buy it or if we can't find an outlet for it so, um, you know, I've been doing so much reading on what's happening in the film market, film industry right now, and it's so volatile, like it's changing all the time. And, in, in, and it has a lot to do with, you know, what's happening on the consumer end, for sure, how people are watching content, uh, what they're willing to pay for, um, age ranges are changing. So, you know, the younger kids who've watched YouTube with ads forever, they don't care anymore about sitting through something with ads. And so that's why Netflix is now saying, yeah, we're going to go to some ad based, you know, programming. Um, and it just kind of then changes everything on down the line. So um, it's very difficult to figure out the landscape and what people are willing to buy. I'm reticent to do narrative work because I've never done it before. And there's a huge learning curve where that is concerned. And so I really would need to partner with, you know, people that understand um, narrative work in order to pull that the Brave Dutch off as a narrative. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I've thought about it, honestly, because Chad and Zach Callahan, they were talking to me about, we really think that this would be in Bill. And I've always said the Brave Dutch would be an incredible narrative film. 
Um, it's just a matter of how do we get that done? Yeah. And do we want to do that? We'll see. Interesting. What just not to derail the entire uh, no, discussion ahead. on this one point, but uh, in your mind, in my see in my non filmmaker brain, you making a movie is making a movie. So w- what are the challenges from making a documentary to making? Oh man, uh, a, more of a script based narrative film. Yeah. Well, so first of all, I'm going to say I I don't know all of them because um, I really am only know how to do documentaries. Um, But what I do know is it starts with the script. You know, whatever you do starts with the script. And so you have to have a really good, strong script to begin with. And that means relying a ton on your writer. Uh, And so the the large bulk of of the narrative film begins there in that writing work. Um, And then from there, um, you know, you've got to get the funding based on the script. Maybe you make a, a little trailer, but the budget would be astronomical if we're going to do the Brave Dutch as a narrative series. Just, I mean, numbers I can't even fathom. But it would mean coming up with this long script and mapping out this big series. And then it would mean with each episode having to storyboard meaning draw out exactly what we would want each scene to look like. Um, There's just lots more people involved in something like that. And there's a lots of other departments. I mean, we would actually be doing war type things. You know, you, you're, you're not relying on any narration. You have to show everything. Yeah. And so it's just a, it's but a Jason would get to make cool bomb sound yes, effects and everything. Yes, That'd be would. amazing. <laughs> The post-production sounds like a lot more fun than the pre-production yeah. part. <laughs> true that. Yeah, true that. And I would imagine uh, you would, if you get a, a name attached to it, right? Someone shows interest, interest yeah. an actor or yeah. something like that. All of a sudden, Netflix and people are like, oh, he's going to be in it or she's going to be in it. Well, then yeah. now we're interested. It's and- a game changer. But again, you don't get those people without a script. You know, right. you, that's why I'm, it all starts with the script. And and so much of it is on the writer and the director to come up with that, you know, important piece. I mean, we, you we could just write the narrative script and sell that. I mean, it's such a valuable piece of property. Um, and so much has to go into that because everything else, everything is determined by what the script says. Yeah. Um, and then once you have a script, it, particularly with, let's say we go with Zach Callahan and I'm a, I'm a director. I certainly don't know that I could be the only director. Um, we're nobodies. And so it, it, it would take somebody, somebody who's got some sort of legacy in Hollywood to join the project to get anybody to pay attention. Otherwise, you know, we're SOL immediately. So yeah. that would be the next part, trying to what find is, somebody. What to does SOL mean? <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny, Jeff Cartner. <laughs> uh, for, the kid, for the kids listening at home, what does SOL mean, Christian? <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a beep in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if that's the case, then it means <laughs> out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope and now I'm gonna put in un- just random unnecessary sensors that's just gonna make Christian sound like a cursing pirate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have such power in your hands, Jason. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So you know, again, I have no idea. I, I talked about this in last week's podcast. I really am sitting at a very murky place. Like when I look out, I'm not sure what's happening next. And I'm not pushing anything forward because I had such a sense of conviction in the very beginning with the girl who wore freedom. I really had a clear vision of what I was supposed to do. And um, I didn't know exactly how to do it, but I was absolutely spot on. I knew what I had to do. And in this situation, I know what I can do. I can see what's possible. Um, but nothing, no door is really opening yet. Um, just getting a lot of closed doors, like with this letter today. So I don't feel an urgency to really push anything forward because I don't want to start something um, if I'm not convinced 100% that this is the right direction to move in. So I'm kind of waiting for some signs. Yeah, that makes total sense. Or something. 
Do you remember in um what was the movie with Jim Carrey where uh he was just praying, praying and asking God for a sign? Do you remember? Bruce Almighty? Yes, that. <laughs> yes, Bruce Almighty. And all of a sudden the big pickup truck with all the signs in it. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop, go back. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of scenes, I think it might be time for our segment, Docu uh, Deja Vu. So here's the thing, man. I love Josh Lindsay. I don't understand why it's so difficult to spit that out of the mouth. I don't know. <laughs> Try it. Docu Deja Vu. Oh, you can say it really well. So why don't you do it? He's here? saying it. He's yeah, yeah. It. So, <laughs> that jingle you just heard was Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, I think Jason and I both agreed it rolls off the tongue easier, but man, it really tripped you guys up for yeah. weeks I think when, when we made Josh the name still change. doesn't like to say it. I know. He's <laughs> Docky View Deja Vu, Docky View Deja Vu, Docky View Deja Vu. It just rolls right off the tongue. Oh, that's hilarious. I think, I think they just, you know, it's actually the three of us, Jason, Josh, and I came up with Docky View Deja Vu, and I think they think it's stupid. So, <laughs> what? Um, maybe he's just trying to get out of saying it by maybe he is that's maybe like how when i clean the podcast anymore i mean that could be it when i clean the house sometimes i don't do as well of a, a good of a job as i should because i'm limited in my knowledge of cleaning the house and then my wife is like i'll just do it and i'll go i guess that worked out maybe that's kind of what josh Lindsay's doing is going i don't want to say this anymore so <laughs> if i keep screwing it up someone else will say it Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, speaking of our favorite documentaries or the ones we want to talk about today, uh, I'll start first. I'm going to go with one that I watched in my travels recently aboard Delta Airlines. Uh, this one is called Jane. It's from 2017, uh, and it is one of those documentary biographies. This is about the life of Jane Goodall, and when I was a young kid in the 70s, I was just mesmerized by Jane and the work that she did with chimpanzees and i always looked up to her and loved anything that had to do with her and her storytelling so it wasn't surprising that i loved this documentary um this talks about her life and um the work that she did with uh with chimpanzees we just lost jason i think just his video his camera went out hmm. yeah i don't know what happened here Good thing my audio stuck around. Yes, good. So nice to have you here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is about Jane Goodall, and it has a lot of footage from when she was young, and you get to see about her life as she develops as a young woman and as a scientist and now as a an advocate for um, you know a healthy planet. So uh, I loved it, thought it was a great doc. I highly recommend it. It has 7.8 stars on IMDb. Um, it's directed by Brett Morgan um, and Jane Goodall was one of the writers. So, all she's right, still, she's still alive. Yeah, she's still alive, alive and kicking. Is she still doing chimpanzee stuff or is she kind she of- She does a lot of advocating, a lot of oh, okay. and teaching and she has an amazing nonprofit um, roots and shoots. It's what it's called. And she really teaches young people all over the world, how to, um, you know, really respect and engage with nature and stuff like that. So cool. Very cool. Yeah. What about you, Jeff? What do you got uh, well, I don't, I don't have all the details that you, I didn't write down the director and the ratings and how many stars. And, uh, but, uh, my wife and I just watched one last night, mostly to prepare for this podcast. Um, but, uh, it's on Netflix and it's called Our Father. Have you heard of this one? I have not. Enlighten me. So it's a little interesting. Um, it's about uh, a renowned infertility uh, specialist who, I guess, like maybe back in the 80s, um, was uh, getting his patients pregnant with his own samples rather than I think Don't, I remember hearing about that. Yeah, this is in Indian Indiana. I think it was in Indianapolis. So your hometown, Jason. Yeah. Uh, do you know this story at all? I do. Yeah. It's yeah. it's insane. Yeah. Insane. And so um we watched that. It was it was fascinating. Um, you know, not to give too much away, but he kept claiming that he only did it when necessary and maybe at max 10 to 15 siblings. But what would happen is these people. I don't think this guy, this doctor ever counted on 
uh, Donald Klein, I think is the name of the uh, doctor. I don't think he ever counted on uh, things like Ancestry.com and 23andMe ever ever being a thing. And so when this generation of, of kids grew up and they knew that they were, um, you know, they were from a donor, then they kind of were curious, like maybe they have half brothers or half sisters out there. And so this generation of, of people started to go online and do these genetic testing and samples. And uh, there was a, a pocket of people that started getting so many hits because they were all related because of this doctor. And uh, it, it's pretty interesting, but uh, man, I won't spoil the whole number, but it's between 10 and a hundred. I mean, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that he kind of quote unquote helped. Uh, and I it's just it, interesting and kind of, you know, well, disturbing. So how, how, what was his mindset between, but about why he would want to do that? They try to uncover that a little bit and they, they, pull the curtain back just a little bit on a potential motive because they could never really take him to court. It wasn't, it wasn't a crime. What he did, technically they couldn't find any crime in what he did uh, like fraud maybe, but they, the prosecutors didn't really know what to charge him with. And so the only thing they did get him on was lying on some official forms. So there was like some obstruction to justice, uh, you know, um, things that they got him with, but they weren't ever ever really able to have a trial where he had to f- talk about what he did and why. Um, but it seems like um, he was a very high up. Uh, he was an elder at his church and uh, he had some certain religious views that were, I think, skewed towards have as many kids as you can and populate the earth and they'll go forth and spread the, the good news. Um, and so I think, they talk about that mindset, but also coupled with this thing called uh, quiverful, which is this, I don't know, are you familiar with that? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, so there's some hints of that too, which maybe has some racist connotations as well. Yeah. Um, so the quiverful movement is what jo- J- Jeff, whatever your name is, <laughs> Jeff is talking about. Yeah, uh, quiver- the yeah, the quiverful. The Christian patriarchal m- movement. Yeah. And to have as many kids as possible. And I think it was a lot of bonus points if they were white. Um, and so I don't know, it's interesting. Um, so we don't really know what the motive was, but uh, it how many seemed, stars would you give it? I would give it like three. Um, I think the reason why I wouldn't give it more stars is because it didn't ever, it didn't really come to a nice, not that you want all the answers, but I guess they laid out like, Hey, this is kind of messed up and here's what happened. And you get to talk, you get to meet a lot of the, the siblings, which is interesting, but you, you know, it's not the film's fault that there wasn't this sort of justice or this sort of like, Oh, here's why he did it. But it kind of left you wanting some resolution to that. And you don't ever really get that because it didn't happen. So, um, so I would say from a storytelling standpoint, I felt like it could have maybe situated itself a little different, but still using all the same components. Hmm. All right. Thank you for sharing. All right, Jason, what do you got? All right. So it's a docu-series. So there's several episodes on several different topics, but it's by Mariana Van Zeller. She's a Portuguese journalist, award-winning journalist. She goes into... I don't even know how to describe these places or topics. It's like the global black market. So she explores where fentanyl's coming from, how it's being made. She covers things like scams, like all the scam calling le- letters and things like that. Um, the one that blew me away, I mean, every single one of them is just amazing. She did one on counterfeit, uh, counterfeit money. So she goes into these, like she gets right there with the source, with, up uh, with, gang members, murderers, drug dealers, and um, just kind of ex- shows the world what's going on and what this looks like. And in each episode you watch, you just can't believe what you're seeing. You can't b- believe that she gets right to the source of everything. And she she's absolutely amazing. Um, you can catch it on Hulu. 
I think you can even stream it directly from National Geographic. Um, that's where the series from. And what's it called? It's called Trafficked. Trafficked. Yeah. Here's my question. And I've been thinking about this actually myself. As documentary filmmakers, we hope that the work that we do makes a significant lasting change, not only in people's lives, not only in the one, you know, person's life that's watching, but also on a grander scale, you know, so the Girl Who Wore Freedom definitely want to open people's minds, challenge them to think about how they treat veterans, but also how they treat older people in general, or think about history, um, or are grateful. Um, and I have hoped that there would be a big impact by showing this film. And I know there has been as I've gone around and shown it in big groups or seen people watch it on the fl plane or heard people say that in Normandy. But really, when you think about it, the change that that you see or the things that maybe make people think are very, very brief. It's not like it has any big, gigantic ripple effect to change the world. Now, you would think somebody like this filmmaker who's doing important work, if people saw what you see, you know, in, in traffic, it would like blow the lid wide open on people that are making counterfeit money or selling drugs or, you know, working in the black market. But I mean, I never even heard of it. Yeah. You know, so why do you think, you know, more people don't hear of it or that that work that she's done hasn't like blown the lid wide open on making counterfeit money? I would say maybe one theory is that there's just so much content available that it's, you know, some of these kind of breakthrough stories maybe just haven't reached enough or you know been seen by enough people just because of that there's just just a lot more available i mean think about just how many streaming services and then it just keeps branching off to from there episodes series movies and so it's it's i think that's the big a big part of it possibly yeah. But, you know, I think, too, I was as I was looking through um, just trying to re remind myself of documentaries that I've watched in the past that I wanted to share about. I ran across another one, which is um, about it was one about Scientology, you know, and there have been a bunch out there now about, you know, Scientology and exposés that they have done and whatnot. And it's just unreal. Like you cannot watch those and think that you know, there, you know, they're so true and you know that it should be disbanded. Sci you know, the Scientology church should just be completely disbanded. And yet they continue to operate with church, you know, tax breaks. And I just don't understand it. Like I said, people have watched the documentary, certainly like police people have heard, you know, the stories and yet things don't make a difference. Why? I also think truth is in a weird place right now. Like uh, people, I don't know, people are just choosing to, if, the, if, if they're confronted with something they don't agree with, even if it's true, they can rationalize it away by saying it's not true or it's very, I don't know. I think, I think we're in an interesting time we live in where, um, the truth that you hear that already resonates with what you're biased towards, those get kind of bumped up in your life. And then the truths that are confrontational to what you already believe, um, those get immediately just sort of rejected or rationalized rather than actually making some sort of meaningful difference in how we see the world. So we could see someone like what Jason was describing, like do these big exposés and someone could easily just go, ah, I don't know. It seems I wouldn't, I don't believe that. Yeah. And so I think people are, that seems like some sort of leftist agenda or, you know, some sort of conservative agenda. And then next thing you know, it just crumbles and it doesn't hold. I think the journalistic integrity of trying to tell these stories doesn't hold the same weight that it did, you know, 20 years ago. That's probably true. There, there is some justice in some of it, though. I will say, like, with in traffic, it's really interesting to see because, like, so the one thing that I took away from the scamming episode, episode where it's, you know, a lot of these things are coming from, like, foreign countries, like in Jamaica. And so she's there in, 
interviewing these people that are doing this for a living and you can you can see that they are people just trying to make do with what they have where they are and then there you do see the flip side of it when they are police chasing them down and what how they're there are actions being taken against them but it's just not as easy there's you know everything that falls in it from politics to logistics to you know everything that would be able to stop that industry as a whole is just not that simple mm-hmm. like it you know that it shows individuals fleeing and getting arrested and getting detained or anything like those type of things but you know that's one person of many hundreds thousands yeah well how many series i mean like how many uh series is that right episode how many seasons or episodes yeah, I, I couldn't tell you without looking it up real quick. I, I know, I think I recently read that they're starting season two or she's working on season two. Okay. So um, I think it's a continue a series that's continuing to put out episodes. Um, I I can only recall seeing three so far. I don't I haven't had a lot, you know, a lot What's of time. What's your favorite? Um, it's hard to favorite topics like scamming and fentanyl and stuff, but... I mean, each one, I just like, like at one point she's literally sitting down with a, with some people and I'm thinking, okay, what, what, what's this like? She has a crew, right? She has a cameraman, maybe just a camera op and it's her, what, however small they keep it. But at one point they're like, are we about to get robbed or even worse? Like, are we, is this about to really happen? And this guy's sitting with a gun in his lap or in his hand or whatever. And he, you know, this whole time they're sitting there with that and they're on their minds and trying to accomplish what they're doing. And it, it's, it, I mean, your heart races for her. She's absolutely amazing or her team and everything they do. So each, each episode, I'm just like blown away by what's what. So I would say start from the beginning episode what one and just follow along what she does because what she exposes and shows you just is just unimaginable in my world. Ah, these are exciting. Thank you guys for bringing these recommendations today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for making time. Um, before we go, I just want to say a little word to our Patreon supporters. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us. I really appreciate everything that you give us each month. Um, I also wanted to let you know now that I'm back, I will be popping into Patreon to say hello. And um, Mindy Cook, who's been helping me out on Patreon, is needing to step back and focus more on some of her paying work right now. So uh, it's just going to be me. We are are looking to add people to our team right now. So if you're listening to this and you're interested in working with a documentary filmmaking team, um, please reach out to me, Christian at documentaryfirst.com. And um, if you think that you have nothing to offer, well, think again. I usually can take people that just have a willing spirit and are interested in things, figure out uh, what they'd like to do and how they'd like to grow and give them a shot. So uh, definitely reach out if you're interested. Um, And thank you guys so much for following along. Um, Thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe that everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody.